We've established that data science is generally about making predictions, estimating some unknown value, or prescribing a course of action. Let's take a look more closely at the types of predictions and decisions we can make, and more generally the types of models we might use to solve these problems. So first, let's talk about supervised machine learning. This technique is common in business and tends to help answer predefined questions. And we try to predict the value of a target variable using a set of input data. Once the model has understood the relationship between variables, the output can be used to make predictions about new data. So there are typically two types of predictions we're trying to make with supervised predictive models. First, we have those questions that answer which one, what category, or true or false questions. These are classification questions that use a set of input data to make predictions about an unknown data point known as the target. Our early example of transaction fraud was an example of classification. We might identify transactions as low, medium, or high risk of fraud. The other type of questions are those that answer how much or how many of something are we likely to see. These are known as regression models. Their goal is to evaluate the likely number of something, and the answer can generally be measured on a continuous scale. Again, we make these predictions based on one or more input variables. You may also have heard of ensemble models, but these are basically just combinations of other models, nothing more. In unsupervised machine learning, we don't have a specific question in mind. We simply have a collection of data that we think is somehow related. Unsupervised learning algorithms often solve clustering problems, which means they create groups of related data points that tend to behave in a similar way. This could be customers that exhibit similar behaviors, cells that respond in similar ways, or streaming users with similar viewing behaviors. Another common category of unsupervised models is variable reduction, which aims to identify the most important columns or features in a data set. This might be used in combination with another machine learning model that has a high number of inputs. Unsupervised models aren't so much about giving us answers as pointing us in the right direction with grouping our data or identifying priorities. Now, discussions on data science are often focused on these two large areas, but there are many other models and algorithms that are used in data science that are less discussed. And so we'll explore those in the next video. A question I always used to ask myself was, if machine learning is just one part of data science, then what other models do people use? And so in this video, I want to show you a more complete picture. Okay, so we have supervised and unsupervised machine learning. We know that. And you may hear the terms imputation or time series regression. And these are just variations of regression or classification. Imputation is about filling in missing data points. And time series regression just looks at variable movements over time. We have two further areas of machine learning, which have been heavily researched in the last few years. Reinforcement learning is where bots learn how to successfully navigate scenarios by repeating them over and over again. Neural networks and deep learning are inspired by biological decision-making processes, using a complex web of nodes to help make decisions. And we also have many other models that fall under the umbrella of data science. So here are a few of the most common you may come across. Monte Carlo simulation is a statistical technique used to quantify uncertainty and risk in predictive and forecasting models. Rule-based models are used to automatically follow rules, often at speeds that a human would not be capable of. Think algorithmic trading, for example. Finally, there are all sorts of other statistical models, such as A-B testing, which is used a lot in marketing to test which of two designs or two advertisements perform better. Many of these models are combined as part of larger projects, and you'll often find examples of models that bridge between different categories. Data science is forever evolving, after all. We'll be exploring a few of these different techniques in more detail throughout the course. I mentioned that model evaluation 
was probably the most important part of the data science process, especially from a business leadership perspective. It's essential for business leaders to have a basic understanding of this area. Let me explain why. Business leaders employ data scientists, analysts and engineers to solve the technical challenges of stats, coding and analysis. These people are exceptionally talented and skilled, but it's the business leaders who provide insight on business objectives, project goals and cost analyses. Only by bringing these two worlds together can we create truly successful data science projects and models that deliver targeted value to the business. Business leaders and data science teams should work closely to align priorities, objectives and measures of success. In order to understand success, business leaders need a basic understanding of how to interpret model outputs and how that might influence strategic decision making. So in the next few videos, I want to take a look at three areas where business leaders can improve their understanding and add value to the data science process. The first area is model objectives. This helps us to answer why are we building this model and what outcome are we targeting. This is particularly relevant when our models are making predictions that categorize data. In essence, we have to be clear on what outcome we're targeting and what types of errors we most want to avoid. For example, with our fraudulent transactions, we're trying to identify the most likely fraud using transaction data. But we should ask ourselves, why? Are we trying to reduce the workload on our human investigators? Are we trying to meet a regulated level of fraud detection? Or are we trying to fulfill an ambitious claim by our marketing team about the robustness of our fraud detection? All of these might affect at what level of certainty we classify a transaction as fraud. By setting the threshold too low, we'll likely catch most of the fraud, but we risk having a lot of false alarms that create a lot of unnecessary work for the team. Conversely, if we set the level too high, we'll have a lot less false alarms, but we might miss some less obvious fraud. Either way, we can't make a decision until we know exactly what we're trying to achieve. Similarly, a nut processing company might have an automated nut filtering system that scans nuts with a laser. Again, there are multiple possible objectives. Are there minimum quality standards enforced by the law? Or perhaps the quality we're willing to accept is dependent on our crop? Or maybe we assess our standards versus our competitors? All of this will affect at what threshold the model should classify a nut as acceptable. Generally, poor quality nuts have high shell damage, and high quality nuts have low shell damage. But there are exceptions, so where should we place the cutoff? Set the threshold too high, and we absolutely ensure the standards of quality. But then we also reduce the pool of nuts that can be sold. This might add additional time and cost before fulfilling orders. Conversely, setting the threshold too low may give us a bigger pool of nuts to sell, but may risk damaging the company reputation with lower quality nuts. So analysts need a very clear understanding of why analysis is being done. To answer these questions, the business needs to quantify and understand the cost of false alarms, of processes of decisions, and the benefits of correct identification. Business leaders need to understand that almost no data science model can be 100% accurate, in the same way that it's practically impossible to travel at the speed of light. As our speed increases and we get closer and closer to that speed, the energy required to go one mile an hour faster increases exponentially. Similarly, as we chase higher and higher accuracy from our models, the higher the marginal cost of time and resources needed to achieve it. So business leaders have a decision to make. How good is good enough? Business knowledge helps teams and leaders balance results with resources. What is the cost of doing this process manually without any automated system? What is the dollar cost of improving this process? How much does our data science team cost the business per month? And does the data science team even have the resources to complete all these projects effectively? 
understanding the answers to these questions will help us better allocate resources. Instead of allocating all resources to a single project, chasing unattainable perfection, perhaps those resources could be better assigned to three projects that each improve a business process by 15%. We can only calculate the right balance by working together. So business leaders should work closely with data science teams and business experts to ensure expectations, objectives, and resources are aligned. Once business leaders and data scientists are aligned on goals, priorities, and measures of success, we can build our model. But a finished model isn't always a good model. Success metrics help us understand how well our models may perform in the real world and whether they'll meet objectives or expectations. Let's take a look at some examples. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, many of us have become familiar with terms like false positives and false negatives. So let's use those terms to discuss another common example, email spam detection. If a spam detector predicts an email is positive, i.e. it is spam, when in fact the email is not spam, the prediction is a false positive or a false alarm. This will result in the email going unread in the user's junk mail, which is obviously not a good outcome. To avoid this scenario, the spam detector may predict more negatives, but now the user often finds junk in their inbox. So what is the right balance? Well, only customer feedback can tell us. Each business scenario requires a unique balance of results. Spam detection or costly machining shutdowns both suffer when we identify too many false alarms. But disease detection, for example, generally tries to avoid false negatives. Better be safe than sorry. On the regression side, when we're predicting how many of something we might expect, we're generally interested in two things, the relationship and the fit. Our relationship tells us that for every one degree of temperature, we're likely to sell an additional 20 barbecues. But our fit asks, does this relationship really explain all the variation in our data? Perhaps there are additional factors at play, like the weekday, that might impact the result. We'll explore some metrics later on that help us consider these questions. In summary, whether you're an analyst, a data scientist, or a business leader, you must understand the basics of model evaluation. This will help you establish and challenge your teams to create models that meet realistic and appropriate performance goals. Okay, so we've looked at three examples why basic knowledge of model evaluation is essential for productive collaboration. Model objectives make sure we're aligned on what we're trying to achieve. Model limitations help us know when to stop and how to distribute resources. And finally, Model evaluation metrics help us agree on the implications of our predictions and whether they meet our objectives.